You're listening to the Foreign and International Medical Graduate Show, a podcast to inspire physicians in the process of immigration to the United States and access to graduate medical education. We create meaningful and helpful content that motivates medical students and doctors throughout the world with the goal of creating a community that supports itself and gives feedback to each other, that stays updated with the most recent tips and advice on how to make it in America and become a successful resident or fellow in the speciality of your dreams. Dr. Alonso Osorio is board certified and residency trained in both emergency and family medicine and will be bringing you 20 years of his personal experiences, struggles and motivation. We'll be chatting with people like you to talk about the lessons they've learned along their personal path, how to make an impact and how we can all benefit from it. Also, we'll analyze the current resources available and how to benefit from them. Thanks for joining us. Please enjoy the show. Hello and welcome back to the podcast. Here we are at the Foreign International Medical Graduate Podcast and 2021 is coming with a lot of energy and a lot of good stuff. I'm extremely excited to bring some phenomenal guests into the show. And today I have Dr. Santiago Acosta Quiroga, alias Santiago AQ, in one of his YouTube channels. And thank you for coming into the show. This is going to be awesome. You have so much amazing content online. And, you know, as you kind of search for people that are helping the foreign and international medical community, you came up as one of the top searches on YouTube. So it is awesome what you're doing for us, for the community, for all of us and the people that are interested on this path. Thank you for coming into the show. Thanks for having me, Alonso. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. So what are you up to these days? Well, I'm <laughs> trying to finish my internship if COVID allows it. Finishing your internship, huh? And uh, I know you're in Bogota, Colombia, and that's the capital of our country. And you're currently doing, currently doing your internship. And how, how is everything going? I know the internship for us sometimes is a very dreaded type of year and a highly, highly busy environment in which we don't have any time, not even to breathe sometimes. And whatever time you have off is just to kind of relax. What is life these days? Well, as you said, uh, it's a very tough time, but thankfully so. Um, on my elective part of my internship, we in Universidad de Rosario have split the internship in two. The first six months is the like, Obligatorio, the internship that's uh, the mandatory. mandatory. We have to do uh, our rotations in internal medicine, in surgery, and that's the very tough part. Now I'm in the elective part of my internship, and uh, I'm currently doing research, so it's a little bit um, lighter loads among these days, and I'm really enjoying it. I'm, <laughs> I'm actually doing research on COVID. I'm really happy to do it. Well, I know that Colombia, in currently in Colombia, COVID is out of control. And there are many social, economical circumstances. And you and I both know that the healthcare system sometimes kind of really doesn't have the network, the support to tolerate such a burden. How you're handling the stress and how you're handling the patient volume uh, these days? Well, as I said, um, when I was on my rotations, which probably we'll get into that later, but uh, I did my first part of my internship before COVID hit the country. So I didn't really notice the effects that it had on the hospital. And nowadays, since I'm doing basically research, I've been only handling the, the tests and the PCRs and all of that, but not really handling the, the sick patients. And so I've been not, a, not as exposed to that part of the, of the situation, not as stressed as other of my peers have been because they're on the ICU or so on and so forth. But well, as for now, everything's going fine. I'm learning a lot and learning the, the best I can about COVID and PCR and lab techniques and all of that. Santiago, I'm going to just congratulate you from the very beginning. You have done such a fantastic job on putting fantastic, uh, high quality, high yield content online for our Colombian friends, for the Spanish speakers through your tutorias in Medicina Interna or teaching for internal medicine on your channel on YouTube that I, has been really successful. But then you decided to take on another huge segment, which are our listeners, our followers, the people like you and I at some point in time thought about coming into America and taking the USMLE. Where the idea of taking on this second project, the English part, was born? 
Well, there's a lot that came into that project. Um, first, I just fell in love with uh, the whole process of shooting videos, editing. Um, at first, I wasn't very serious with my other channel. Uh, it wasn't until we hit like 7,000 subscribers that we actually got into looking up uh, how to make a, a video look good and all of that. But once the, all of that started rolling up and adding up, so the, the feedback was overwhelmingly positive. And um, as YouTube did its thing and expanded our content, some, of, uh, some English uh, subscribers started adding up and they started messaging me saying, hey, uh, great content, but I can't really understand most of what you're saying. Could you please make, could you please make a video in, in English? Uh, could you please do that? Could you please do this? And enough comments added up, stacked up, that I one, one day I thought, okay, I, I love doing this. I love uh, shooting videos, editing, all of that. Right now, I have the time because I'm doing research. I don't. I'm not as stressed or as um, burdened. Yeah, I, I don't. I have a lot of more time in my hands. So why don't we do it? Re- really, the biggest thing that concerned me was that I I thought I didn't have a good level of English to carry the project. Uh, I've never been really confident with my with my speaking skills, um, but I thought. Hey, I, I think I have something to share. I think that my message could help people. So let's go ahead and do it. And let's hope for the best. From my end and my personal feedback on your English, I think is perfect. There is no problem. The message is coming across really, really neatly. And I personally enjoy watching your shows. I think they're engaging. The transition of your editing is remarkably smooth. And, and you know what is the important thing? You're doing something because you love it. You have a lot of passion for it and people are liking it. So there is a lot of positive feedback. I know that we're not becoming richer, but, you know, at least you know that you're doing something for the people. And believe it or not, this is going to help you, I think, in the future for your application because you're a very altruistic person. Who else? How old are you? I forgot to ask you. 24. Who else at the age of 24 is doing what you have been doing for thousands and thousands of people, not only in Colombia, but across the planet, a very small percentage. So kudos go to you. I really appreciate that message. It is a great thing. So I know that you have your own content and, uh, and your own way to study for the USMLE. As you have said in one of your episodes, the amount of material out there is overwhelming, overwhelming. And Dr. Shala already in one of our previous episodes, devised his own method. I know that the method was very popular in the Spanish version, and you have an episode on the way you study medicine in Spanish, and that it worked for you, and then you translated this into your English channel. Tell us about your method and how you do it in a brief way. Okay, but um, to make things clear, my method to study medicine, like in general, or just specific to the USMLE? Well... Thanks for, for, for clarifying. I would say, since our listeners are really interested about the USMLE, let's talk about how you did it specifically for step one and step two. Well, I, I actually um, went ahead very pragmatically, I, I believe that's a word, um, because I thought, okay, the, the exam is basically 280 questions, but the special thing about the USMLE, as far as I can tell, it's not that they're asking these very difficult concepts, but they're taking concepts that everybody knows or that everybody can learn. And they're asking them in a way that makes you always get confused and put the wrong choice. So I said, okay, you have to train myself to do that properly, to have the ability to answer difficult questions. So I spent 90% of my time in the step one answering questions. That was it. That was really the key. And in fact, in my step to CK, I spent 99% of my time, if not 100%, doing just questions. I do believe there are the answer. And in fact, if you look up into the evidence, there, there are some studies that have been done, not the biggest studies there are, but studies that specifically address what are the best techniques to study for the USMLE. And over and over again, they show that doing questions is the only method that gradually increases the score of the applicant is the only have the, is the only strategy that has that 
So I took advantage of that and I put myself the like the goal of answering 15,000 15, questions for the step one and around 10,000 questions for the step two. 15,000 listeners. Hey, guys, 15,000 <laughs> for step one and 10,000 for step two. So he went over 25,000 questions. OMG. Where do you get so many out of? Where, where do you get those databases? <laughs> well, the, there's thankfully a lot of um, good Q banks out there. Obviously, UWorld, that's like a staple of every <laughs> starting routine in the USMLE. Ambos was really helpful. Um, I tried for both tests, past test, USMLE RX, and MedBullets for the step one. What else did I, did I try? No, I think that those those are it. Maybe I'm missing someone on the step uh, on, on the step one, but on the step two, those were it. Wow! So you started, and you realized that soon the evidence suggested that questions were the choice. Obviously, before you answer questions, Santiago, you had to have the knowledge. In my case, I went and I studied every single book of every little topic, and that was just me back in 2000. I had no internet databases. I just purchased every book and I did, I read the book, highlighted the book. I know that, that you are very particular about how <laughs> you transfer information from one place to the other and, and you have your way to teach yourself. But uh, where do you gather the basic content to study or how much of deep study into a topic or not you did on your own on, on books dedicated to do so? In my step one, I, I had like that mentality that I first le need to learn the topics and then apply the knowledge. So I, I read the first aid, I watched the, the Boards and Beyond videos, I even watched Pathoma, Goli, and I filled myself with everything I, I could. Um, and then I started doing the Q-Banks. But looking back, I don't really think that's necessary. I think that there's, there's a talk in TED really good ab about... Um, with professor, I'm, I'm forgetting his name, but he's a famous psychologist. And, and, and he basically says that we have to get away of this uh, mindset that we first learn and then apply because applying is a way of learning by itself. And, and I tried the experiment with the step to CK. With the step to CK, I actually started right off the bat doing questions, just questions. And of course, at first my, my scores were... were <laughs> Not very good, to say the least. Like 40, 50%. Uh, I wasn't very good with my performance. But if you just stick to it, if you just keep doing the questions, you'll gather the knowledge. And not only that, but you'll gather it in a way that makes you um, learn it more profoundly. I don't know if that's a word, but um, it makes so much sense because the content is learned in a way that has a context in the way, in a way that you know how it's being asked. So it's not a, like a rote memory type of thing that isolated concept and it worked perfectly i i'm i'm amazed that i that i got the score that i got because as i said when i started my step to ck prep all of my scores at the at first were 50 60 but if you just keep doing that over and over again you learn and you not only learn but you get better at applying that knowledge practice makes perfect Well, do you consider yourself a good test taker because of the amount of questions that you actually worked on? Or do you think that you were a test taker before you decided to take 25,000 questions? No, I, I do think I, I have some abilities to answer tests. It's, it's, it's rather hard to say because I've always liked doing uh, question banks. Ever since, to explain a little bit better, uh, I, don't, I didn't have this idea of going to the States right up until my internship. Before that, I was planning to go to, to Spain to do infectious diseases. But it turns out that there is no infectious diseases over there. So I had to reformulate all of my plans. But anyways, even before having the idea of going to the States, I always prepped with USMLE material. I always did USMLE questions because I thought they were so good. So ever since I was in like second, first year of medical school, Wow. I, do, I did a lot of questions. In fact, for my gastroenterology rotations, I just studied with questions. And it was one of my best uh, notes. Wow, one of the best grades that you got. Well, that's, that's a good way to see it. In my personal case, I came to the United States to play tennis. And then when I came back to 
Colombia, I decided to buy pretty much all the books in English and I was studying for my classes in English. I didn't realize that I really wanted to come into America probably until the fifth semester and that's when I really got deep into it. But, you know, we're talking 20 years ago. Things have changed and now I would say it's more competitive. And wow, talking about competitive and detouring myself here a little bit, I want to congratulate uh, Dr. Acosta Quiroga on his USMLE Step 1 score. It was 262. And the score on the 2CK was 272, which makes you in what percentile? In, in the step one is 98, and step two is a 99. It's not a matter if you're going to get an interview. It is a matter, <laughs> sure, where do you want to get that interview? <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. That's impressive. I think... Uh, and how do you feel about now the new pass and fail score? I know that you have studied so hard to obtain a high percentile score of, you know, up there, 98, almost impossible. How do you feel about the pass fail determination for next year? Well, it's a very difficult subject because, as you may know, they, they took the decision that they, for everyone who, had a, who has a score in 2022, they're going to keep their score. Just that okay. everybody who does this test afterwards, you're going to have pass and fail. At first, I thought, no, this is like the end for IMGs because I was with this mentality that that is our presentation letter, that we, if we don't have a good step one score, we're doomed. And I'm not going to lie, having a good step one score makes everything easier, especially if you want to get into competitive specialties or competitive hospitals. But the more I, because, well, as, as also you may know, in my Spanish YouTube channel, Tutorias Missing Interna, I do interviews with a lot of medical doctors yes. who have managed to get into Mayo clinics in surgery or, I don't know, the internal medicine in pain. Radiology. And exactly. And as I interviewed each one of them, I, I suddenly realized that that story, the, the applicant with the 250 in the step one score, and they, with uh, four published papers and uh, with three layers of recommendation, that's the perfect applicant. But that's not the, the way for most people to get into the States. And as I realized that, I, I realized that, okay, yeah, for many people out there, the pass and fail will be something that makes everything harder. Because if you have a good score, that makes everything easier. So taking away that part of your application, it's going to make it a little bit tougher to show your value. But for most people, I don't think that's going to be the case. I, I did this exercise. Everybody who's listening can do the same. Taking the, the stats that the NRM, NRMP match uh, publishes each year. Yes. You do that with the IMGs. I did it only with the IMGs. Uh, you see that only 30% of the applicants have a, a step one score uh, above 245. Only 30%. Only 30%. Well, that my rough estimations, maybe it's a little bit more, a little bit less. But that really struck me because only 30% really has a score who that works in favor of them. The other 70%, I think that is, are still stressed because to study, to step one. Most of them take a year, maybe even a year and a half and just focus on the step. And they go through all of this and still get a score who's, that is less than 240. If we all of a sudden raise that score into a pass and fail, maybe all those uh, people can concentrate into improving their CVs, into having a better step 2CK score, making for a better applicant overall. I think uh, if you play your cards correctly, you can take advantage of the pass and fail. But if you're the type of applicant who thinks that you just need the step one, and if with, with a good step one score, you're passing, that's that's the one who's going to be hurt with this with this change wow that makes so much so much so much sense well and what's been the criticism the feedback the comments the gossip that you had to deal with among your peers and medical students colleagues attending physicians professors teachers mom dad regarding your takeoff into the United States in the near future. And the reason why I'm asking is because we're saying 
there is no need to do so. You're going to go and waste your time. You're not going to learn anything. Medicine in Colombia is the way to do. We're clinical people, da da da, blah, blah, blah. People had envy, made bad comments. You know, it was a tough sometimes situation of dealing with the envy that surrounded the whole effort of trying to come into the United States. Well, I actually had the good fortune of having a very supportive family, very supportive friends. Like everyone I talked to said, go ahead, try it out. If if you're not happy with it, well, stop, do the thing that you like. But I had almost no negative comment when I started pursuing this journey. In fact, my university, my university, not really. My, my professors who I talked about, they said, go ahead. I'm sure you can do it. And yeah, that, that's, I, I can't really complain. I, I've been, oh, that's a blessing. I've been blessed with that. Well, Dr. Santiago Acosta attends one of the most prestigious, and I wish I could have attended La Universidad Colegio Mayor Nuestra Señora del Rosario, which is a private university and one of the top, if not the best or one of the best uh, medical schools in my country. And I'm proud to say so that it really probably brings some of the most highly qualified physicians in Colombia. And I think to this day, it still remains to be that way without judgment or criticism to all my other Colombian universities or all, <laughs> even my own alma mater, La Universidad Industrial de Santander, which I think is a fantastic medical school. But in general, Universidad Del Rosario has been has been amazing. Yeah, it, it's really been. And I'm not sure if to call it a blessing, but I do think that the way the university has been set up, because we've been through these changes in the curriculum and all of that, has made me, has allowed me to expand at will uh, to reach my goals. To, for, for, for instance, um, if COVID hadn't uh, had its effect, I'd be spending these six months of internship on, on the States. Wow. Everything changed, of course, but not every university has that um, a gift for students. Some of them don't even have electives or have just one month, two months. So has really been uh, amazing at uh, helped me uh, get to my goals. Has all this studying after 25,000 questions and thousands of hours burning your eyelids on the books, <laughs> and long nights and anguish and suffering, has it made you a better doctor? Do you think you're say. a better physician because of all the knowledge that you acquire? It's hard to say because a heart physician in the sense that you are better dealing with patients, not necessarily. But I do think it makes everything easier. When when I got back to my internship after I took a semester off to, to present the steps, after getting back to my initial rotation, I did a rotation in endocrinology, an elective. Uh, everything just made sense. Like it, it, it was so amazing. Even the things that I didn't knew, even the things that uh, were presented to me, like new diseases, new things, I could come up with explanations that were actually true or, made, or were very close to the real facts. And I attribute that to the USMLE step because you get all of this training with a lot of concepts, sometimes even very detailed concepts, but that overall just teaches you how to think, which is the most important thing that I got from my steps, the ability to think about almost any disease or any concept in medicine. Awesome. And, and where do you learn your English? Because it's really good. I know that you attended a, a private high school, Colegio San Bartolomé, correct? Right. And uh, they're probably really strong on their English side. I, I had, I, I guess, and I'm assuming you probably had a lot of an influence on that. Or I don't know if you have traveled a lot to the United States or were born or raised here, but your English is pretty good. How do you gather this level of English confidence? Well, thank you so much. And that, that's really always been one of my main insecurities. But um, yeah, my, my high school was very uh, good at teaching English. In fact, I, I always believed maybe it's, it's because you always think that the grass is greener on the other side. But yeah. I always thought I had a better level of English once I graduated my high school than, than the one I have now. But anyways, we, have that, we had that training. And afterwards, during medical school, I just uh, make sure to read as much as I could in English, because it's no secret that 
the best literature, with exceptions one, oh, here and there, is in English. The New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, and I really enjoy learning from those types of articles. So I was constantly uh, having exposure to the English language also watching movies i hate watching movies in spanish especially in uh, <laughs> spanish espanolete <laughs> como el eh, hostia tío es yo no puedo i i can't do with i can't deal with that those type of movies so i always watch movies in english so i always thought that my level of hearing and reading was up to the part but my speaking that that's the problem because we don't take into practice a lot of speaking so I think that the miracle that you're understanding me right now is due to YouTube. If not, <laughs> I probably would be bumbling around here. How do you see yourself having uh, to deal with the patient encounters for a step two CK? Are you going to come and do observerships, rotations? How do you think you're going to get your exposure, your letters of recommendations? What do you foresee for the future coming for you down the pipe? That's very hard to say. Um, my idea... Uh, a year back, a year ago, was have almost all of my electives on the States, uh, get my letters of recommendation, maybe even uh, get a position in some research fellowship, I don't know. But all of that is on hold. I At this point, I don't really know what to do because I've sent so many letters to every hospital and the, the response I get is always hey, uh, that your resume is great, We're, we would be thrilled to have you here, but the current situation doesn't allow us to receive any international travelers. And, 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 and really, that's, that's it. Like, there is no way to force it. There's no way to go in around it. And currently, I'm just hoping for the best. Uh, I'm expecting, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to see what happens with the step to CS. Uh, when can I schedule it, if that's a wise decision. Uh, regarding my, my clinical rotations, if I could squeeze maybe a couple of rotations during April, March, maybe things are a little bit better, I'll do so. If not, I'll try to, I'll try to see how I can improve my CV otherwise. Yeah. Uh, by no means, I'm an authority regarding the USMLE or how things are happening for IMGs and FMGs uh, during 2020, 2021, and God knows if it's going to be like that for 2022. But in general, the take on on all this is that COVID has made it harder for us, for the medical graduates, to find the rotations, to get the letters of recommendations that we need. And it has been harder for us to get the exposure that we need. And the rumor has it that FMGs are not getting as many interview uh, invitations uh, as we expected for this current mm -hmm. cycle of 2020-2021, which is kind of sad. I don't know, in your younger circle of colleagues that are going through this process that you're going through, what is their opinion on the whole situation? Well, most of them are actually playing like the safe card, I think. They, they're waiting to see how everything unfolds. And they're probably expecting to apply to the next match. I have just one friend. Uh, she's brilliant. She had like a 264 on the step one, like a 270, I think, in the step two. I know, uh, 260, well, 267 on the step two CK. Oh. So she's, she's brilliant. And she's actually having a lot of fun. She has been invited to Mayo Clinic, uh, Cleveland Clinic. So she, she, but probably she's an outlier that... <laughs> I think that's fair to say. So I don't think that reflects the reality of most people because I can I can see how not having rotations, not having letters of recommendation can negatively impact most of us. So she's an exception and she's been really lucky at getting all this. You said that she's been able to obtain residency interviews in, in very prominent medical schools in the U.S. without the need of doing clinical rotations or observerships no, in the she, U.S.? She actually it did have uh, like a couple of rotations, but that was back in, I don't know, 2018, something like that. So she, she, she was very lucky with that. That's another hassle that we foreign medical grads have to find a way to kind of jump across. Uh, first of all, not only having great scores, but, you know, you need to take one day at a time, one one concern at a time. You know, you deal with the step one. That's called that's why it's called a step one. Then you concentrate on a step two. And then 
you find yourself in the position that Dr. Santiago Acosta Quiroga is right now. Is that, am I going to take a step three? I'm going to take a step two CS. What am I going to do? Am I going to be applying for this match? Am I going to hold back? And believe me, if you guys are right now sitting at home, looking at us and hearing what we have to say, you're not the only one going through this situation. Thousands, thousands of people across the planet are having the same thoughts that Dr. Santiago had, that I had 21 years ago. So just leave your comment, leave your feedback down at the bottom because people can probably give themselves each other feedback and just kind of get the conversation going, get the conversation started and just see what other options we have. And if you guys know of a good way to kind of make this COVID uh, pandemic influence that it had in for us, It'll be awesome to kind of hear what's out there, what's new, what are the solutions for this problem. Well, Dr. Quiroga de Santiago uh, Acosta Quiroga, Dr. AQ, Santiago AQ, it's been awesome speaking to you in English. Before we finish the first part of our interaction in English and move into a little comment to our people that are Spanish speaking only, due to the fact that we're both Colombian and I would love dearly to give some feedback to our Colombian listeners. What would be the last word of advice that you would give someone that is thinking about sitting down for step one and step two right now? I'll try to make the advice a little bit more general, not only sure. to the steps, but only Absolutely. But to the whole Go path. Ahead. It's very hard. Everything you're going to experience will test your limits. Mm, the steps, the rotations, the improving your English part, all of that, you will feel that as if you are not up for the challenge. But thousands of people before you and thousands of people after you are doing it. Some of them are smarter than you, some of them not smarter than you. And at the end of the day, it's hard work what brings you to the other side. One, one good friend of mine who's actually a physician in the States told me that the People who are successful in this process are not the smartest ones, but the ones that have the brain, like the motivation, the willpower to say, I'm going to do everything that it takes to get myself to the other side. So it's really hard. Don't kid yourself. It's really tough, but it can be done. So be perseverant and be consistent. I just, I'm going through a book uh, called The Compound Effect. On the first two chapters, he only talks about the daily effort, the daily grind, the daily commitment, the consistency of the effort is what will give you the success down the road. So just take it one day at a time, commit yourself to a hundred questions today. Like you said, you were doing about a 50 to a hundred some questions a day, something unreal. So if you want to have the honor and be proud of saying and telling people that you have answered about 25,000 plus minus questions for the USMLEs, Dr. Santiago AQ is there to, to be <laughs> one, one for the show. Anyway, to our foreign and international medical graduates anywhere across the world, remember there is a button here down below right there that you guys need to click and subscribe. And there's going to be some show notes at the end of the episode, uh, the very bottom in YouTube. So feel free to please leave your comments, your feedback, because those help us to really get up on the rankings, uh, be on the priority of the search engine. That's how the message gets across. Share it. Diffuse the message on every single podcast uh, platform out there. And it's going to help Dr. Santiago AQ. It's going to help me to grow this community and to deliver this uh, message that we make with a lot of love to all of you. So Santiago, thank you for joining us and please say goodbye to our English listeners. Bye everybody. And have a really good match in, in today's, <laughs> in 2020. That's awesome. Bueno, Santiago, our English listeners, we're going to have a little conversation in English. If you want to turn off your phone and uh, tune into something else, um, Probably listen to Santiago's videos in English that are really good on the YouTube channel. Oh, Santiago, before we say goodbye, how do we get a hold of you on YouTube? And how do we get a hold of you if you want any advice? If you want to see my YouTube videos, just put Santiago AQ. I'm the first, uh, the first channel that pops up. That's my channel. 
And if you want to contact me, just uh, send me a DM to santiago.aq. I usually never see my email, so that's really not a very smart way to contact me. But I'm always um, on the lookout for DMs in my Instagram. So make sure to send me a DM. Direct message him. He has already told you. So listen, listen to his videos. They're all phenomenal from A to Z. He has uh, topics on uh, COPD in Spanish. Uh, he has topics for USMLE, step one, step two, step three. He has fantastic, phenomenal guests. Uh, that tells all about their experiences. And I guess experiences is what life is like and sharing your experience will just only make you better. Gracias. So, mis colombianos, la gente de habla hispana, bienvenidos. Voy a dedicar unos minuticos con el doctor Santiago Acosta Quiroga, colega compatriota, eh, 24 años. Yo recuerdo que me gradué de la escuela de medicina cuando tenía 21. Eh, eh, te gané por tres. Muy joven, <risa> sí, se estaba pensando. <risa> y muy, muy orgulloso de, de la tarea que has hecho. Es, es realmente impresionante ver que, que tienes el tiempo y la dedicación para enseñar a la gente. Yo lo que he visto es que te has vuelto un mejor médico, un mejor profesor, un mejor docente. A través de los videos se ve el proceso de maduración que has alcanzado y la calidad del mensaje como se está distribuyendo y yo creo que lo que dicen muchos profesores lo que decían eh, Platón y Sócrates, enseñar simplemente te hace un mejor profesor un profesor pero también te hace un mejor alumno de tú mismo y, y, y eso es lo que has hecho ¿Cómo nació la idea de, de crear estos canales en el internet, en YouTube y, y comenzar con un mensaje en habla hispana? Pues en realidad eso fue Pura coins, pues como un golpe de suerte, yo creo, porque el primer canal, el canal de tutoría de medicina interna, que es el más grande que tenemos, eh, yo un día estaba dando una tutoría de antibióticos y es un tema que es relativamente difícil de aprender, es mucha memoria. Y yo dije, sería súper chévere si mis estudiantes pudieran meterse a YouTube y ver ese video, lo que estamos hablando de esto, cuántas veces ellos quieran y aprenderse los antibióticos perfecto. Y entonces así nació, entonces comenzamos a subir las charlas que hacíamos normalmente solo que una versión online para que ellos vieran cuando quisieran. YouTube comenzó a hacer lo suyo, comenzó a distribuir el contenido, de la nada comenzaron a llegar comentarios de México, de Uruguay, de Perú, diciéndoles que les encantaban los videos. Y cuando íbamos como por los 7.000 suscriptores, ahí Andrés y yo, que somos los, los que eh, eh, llevan el canal, dijimos, bueno, pongámonos serios. Y ahí fue donde comenzamos a hacer videos semanalmente, a ver lo del logo, a ver que, por ejemplo, invertir en una buena cámara, cosas así. Y, y sí, pero nació como de, de a poquito, nosotros ni siquiera sufrimos esto. O sea, yo, por ejemplo, yo me acuerdo que yo subía videos a las 3 de la mañana después de grabarlos. Ahora eso sería un delito porque, pues, ¿quién va a ver un video a las 3 de la mañana? Y, pero no, se dio, la respuesta ha sido extremadamente buena y creo que eso también es parte por la que comencé el segundo canal en inglés. Ha sido fantástico, y, y específicamente a la, a la audiencia colombiana, eh, tus compañeros en, en la Universidad del Rosario, tu familia, ¿qué dicen al respecto? ¿Te llaman el youtuber, el influenciador? Sí, <risa> eso ha sido muy... Yo he pasado por todas las fases, al puro principio cuando solamente lo subíamos y esa, nadie, nadie le importaba, nadie los miraba, Después, cuando comenzamos como a promocionar los videos y, y qué tal, la gente se, se nos burlaba. Pero cuando el canal comenzó a llegar a los 10.000, 20.000, es el, el impacto ha sido impresionante. Pues yo, yo todavía no me, no, no, me, no me... O sea, sentirse como esto de youtuber es, es, un, es un poco extraño que la gente, uno lo vea en cuando yo voy a mi universidad y la gente que me reconoce. Y yo todavía no sé muy bien qué decir cuando me dicen, no, me encantan tus videos. Pero la respuesta ha sido impresionante. O sea, ha, ha sido de las mejores experiencias. Es increíble que la tecnología en el siglo XXI nos ha permitido llegarle a tanta gente. Eh, solamente piensa en proporciones. Yo sé que te, a ti te gustan los números, pero a tener 20 mil suscriptores quiere decir que a cierto tiempo has tenido una audiencia de 20 mil personas en un estadio que pagaron un tiquete para escuchar lo que tú tenías que decir. Simplemente eso ha estado guardado para la posteridad y es en demanda 24 horas al día, 7 días a la semana, 365 días al año. Eh, obviamente el material que tú creas es lo que se llama Evergreen y ah, le sirve a mucha gente por mucho tiempo. 
cosas cambiarán en 5 o 10 años en medicina, es, pero el fenómeno del internet y la capacidad que te permite de alcanzar a tanta gente es fenomenal. Sí, es que es, que es algo realmente es, parece ridículo, porque hace poquito yo estaba viendo las estadísticas y hay uno de nuestros canales, de, en, hay uno de nuestros videos de cirrosis, que ya llegó a 51 mil vistas. Yo me puse a pensar, yo esta, esta, esta clase me dediqué mucho para hacerla, para quedar muy bien y que las 60 personas que iban a recibirla la disfrutaran. Pensar que eso lo han visto esas 60 personas, pero multiplicado por 100 mil veces, es algo que es inconcebible. Realmente uno no, es algo que no se puede como poner en palabras. Es un mensaje altruista, eh, la cual... Si algún día yo creo que te pregunten eh, por qué quieres ser internista, por qué quieres ser infer infectólogo, yo creo que este puede ser un hook para que la, llamar la atención, cómo conectar en tu personal statement a la gente que se sientan atraídos. A, a, a y te digo la verdad, inclusive todos los americanos que aplican al USMLE eh, y tratan de aplicar a residencia en los Estados Unidos, yo creo que por ahí el 1% tiene una influencia en Internet de esta manera. Obviamente todo el mundo tiene un Facebook y tienen un Instagram y publican pendejadas y, y, y fotos aquí, fotos allá, pero que, que tengan un material profesional de alto contenido que, como dicen, que embellezca tu presentación eh, profesional, son muy pocos. Yo creo que esto simplemente va a ser un beneficio. En fin, eh, tú eres el maestro de los muchos colombianos que han sido exitosos Muchos o pocos, como se quiera decir, que en tener percentiles al, a, 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 al norte del 98% en USMLE. ¿Cómo conseguiste esta meta? Bueno, pues eso en realidad es, es lo que he intentado pues, compartir de manera detallada en YouTube. Pero el consejo siempre es... Yo, yo creo que los tres consejos más importantes son, uno, hacer un montón de preguntas. Yo realmente creo que esa es la respuesta para tener una, un buen puntaje. Como nosotros estamos hablando ahorita en la sección en inglés, yo creo que de, de pronto, porque uno comienza a ver las ganancias decrecientes a medida que hace más y más y más, pero yo sí creo que esas 15 mil preguntas, si no fueron el 100% de la razón por la que saqué ese puntaje, fueron el 90%. Porque algo que yo sí me gustaría es mentir aprovechando esta oportunidad, es que alguien que saca esos puntajes es alguien que se las sabe absolutamente todas. No necesariamente. Uno puede desarrollar habilidades que le ayudan a responder preguntas, aunque uno no se sepa el dato específico puntual. Y yo creo que uno desarrolla esa, esa habilidad puntualmente es haciendo preguntas. Entonces, eso creo que es lo primero. Lo segundo que es vital y yo no lo veo tan recomendado en, en, en los videos y en eso, eh, es tiene una estrategia a largo plazo, porque uno no quiere estudiar hoy, sino que uno quiere estudiar hoy y mañana y en un mes, y en, usualmente esto involucra seis meses de estudio, incluso más. Y a, a mí algo que me pasó en mi step one es que yo me terminé quemando, porque al principio de, de querer hacer tantas preguntas, se me fue la mano. Yo estudiaba 14 horas al día, 15 horas al día, y eso me dejó tostado. Eh, le bajé un poquito, me tocó sacrificar un poquito el número de preguntas, igual, pero igual lo, lograba mantener unas, hacer unos 80 al día, 120 al día, y eso me dejó en un, un estado mental mucho mejor. Porque claro. creo que a veces intentando perseguir este sueño, uno mismo se puede convertir en su, en su peor enemigo. Entonces tener esa, esa cautela de tomar las cosas con calma, hacer una cosa a la vez. Y aparte de eso, es hacer las cosas a conciencia. Que creo que es otra cosa con la que, yo, yo con la que me, me costó. Porque uno a veces simplemente va como through the motions, como simplemente uno sigue el camino y uno lee la página y uno dice, sí, 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 esto me lo sé. Como un burrito, sí, sí. así. Exacto. Y uno tiene que estar consciente. Cada pregunta que uno tiene al frente es como si esa pregunta me pudiera salir en el examen. Y, si, y puede que sea la, ulti, la única vez que me sale. Y si no me lleve el mensaje, perfectamente eso es un punto menos. Y si uno acumula suficientes de esos, es una diferencia entre un 240 y un 260. Bailas. Wow, consejos... De, de, de una persona, persona exitosa. En, en general, la aceptación va a ser muy buena. Quiero ayudarte a crecer. Me encanta que hubieras venido al programa. Estoy muy emocionado. Te voy a decir cómo te encontré. Simplemente en la búsqueda de material y contenido para foráneos, porque obviamente toda la gente me pregunta, ¿y usted cómo saca? 
tantas cosas para hablar de, you know, esto requiere un poquito de investigación en el tiempo que estás por ahí por perder, qué hay que ofrecer, qué ha pasado, qué es, y eso requiere mucho tiempo de dedicación. Me encontré con tu nombre y te quiero felicitar. Es, es, es un honor, honor de un colombiano que está haciendo esta labor tan, tan fructuosa y, y obviamente yo creo que te va a ir muy bien en este proceso. Te agradezco por tu tiempo y solamente quiero darte un abrazo distante y desde aquí, desde la Florida, para motivarte en el proceso de que no te des por vencido y que mucha gente se va a beneficiar de lo que tú estás haciendo y quería llevar tu mensaje a todos nuestros amigos eh, colombianos, hispanoparlantes en España, Latinoamérica, Centroamérica y aquellos latinos, colombianos, etcétera, que también viven aquí en los Estados Unidos. Y, y pues no quiero que todos mis médicos colombianos se fuguen sus cerebritos para el, el exterior, pero pues si consideran, si consideran tomar los exámenes del USMLE, obviamente los recursos del doctor Santiago Acosta Quiroga son muy buenos y son muy buenos, son fantásticos. Una preguntita más antes de despedir el episodio. ¿Por qué hay esta obsesión de la gente con los cursos de Kaplan y que si no tomas el Kaplan y hablan del Kaplan allí, del curso de allá y de los 7 mil, 12 mil, 10 mil dólares y, 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 y se gastan dinero y la sufren para conseguir la platica y, y, y no sé, que, ¿cuál es tu punto de vista al respecto? Sí, pues yo, yo siento que parte de eso eh, ya sé en el hecho de que uno siente que es, yo siento que es como invertir porque uno cuando invierte, uno tiene una, una cantidad de plata y uno quiere decir, bueno, si ocurre algo malo, por lo menos se la di un inversionista, alguien que en teoría sabe lo que está haciendo, y si, el, si pasa algo, fue el error de él, no mi error. Entonces, de cierta manera, yo a veces creo que es, esa, es como eso de, no quiero que me vaya mal, entonces le voy a dar la plata a alguien que me diga qué es lo que hay que hacer. No siempre, pero siento que hay una, un, un elemento de eso, y el otro es que, pues no hay mucha información, eso en realidad fue una de las motivaciones para comenzar a subir este contenido. Cuando yo me metí, habían algunos videos en inglés, eh, recomendaciones aquí y allá, pero en español no había casi nada, no había casi nada, eh, había algo, algunas personas que decían lo que hicieron, que decían, pero realmente no había como una guía, no había alguien que le dijera, mire, realmente esos cursos lo único que hacen es organizar la información que uno tiene que hacer, pero al final de cuentas, el que tiene que... Entonces uno, y si uno le va mal, ellos le dan una receta que ellos a veces les funciona y ya, pero al final de cuentas la responsabilidad sigue recayendo en uno. Entonces yo he intentado hacer eso un poco más consciente eh, y creo que cuando uno lo piensa por, 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 un, por unos minutos uno se da cuenta que, que realmente son cursos que se pueden utilizar, hay mucha gente que les va muy bien, pero que al final de cuentas no son esenciales, no son necesarios. Si uno los quiere usar, por ejemplo, no sé, hay gente que realmente los usa, por ejemplo, para hacer contactos, que me parece perfecto, sí. si ese es el objetivo de uno. Muy bien. Pero si uno no tiene 7 mil dólares andando por ahí, eso no quiere decir que uno no pueda comenzar a estudiar por su cuenta y tener un excelente puntaje. Wow. ¿Cuál, fue, cuál ha sido la inversión financiera hasta ahora que tú has tenido en este proceso? Eh, en promedio. Pues a ver, ambos exámenes valen como mil dólares cada uno. Entonces ahí van dos mil dólares los bancos de preguntas pongámosle, pues que yo compré un montón de bancos de preguntas, pongámosle que se fueron otros dos mil dólares ahí en bancos de preguntas, en el step one y step dos juntos y entonces eso, eso vendría siendo cuatro mil y yo creo que con las pequeñas cosas, el tiempo que uno aplaza el, lo, 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 lo que estaría haciendo si no hubiera aplazado yo creo que el costo de oportunidad daría por ahí que otros mil, entonces unos cinco mil, seis mil dólares, yo creo que hasta el momento y todavía falta el step 2 y es, el step 3 y el match. Entonces, es usualmente una vez yo, yo leí que más o menos ronda entre los diez mil, once mil dólares la inversión y creo que más o menos la mía va a terminar por ahí. Es una inversión para la vida. Yo creo que desde el punto de vista que lo tomes, inclusive si no pasas los exámenes, yo creo que te vuelves un mejor médico. Y si no te vuelves mejor médico, al menos te vuelves un mejor test taker. <risa> no, exacto. Es que uno, uno lo tiene que pensar así, porque si uno lo piensa como voy a gastar el dinero para hacer cosas que... No, uno tiene que pensar como estoy invirtiendo en mi calidad de vida futuro. 
de que si paso al otro lado, porque uno va a pasar al otro lado, el recupero esa inversión en menos de un año. Esa es la idea. Bueno, quiero aprovechar la oportunidad para saludar a toda mi gente en Colombia que está pasando por esta pandemia. Yo sé que el sistema de salud en este momento en Colombia es un poquito exprimido. Yo sé que hay muchos médicos generales, internistas, urgenciólogos, etcétera, pediatras en todas las especialidades, realmente trabajando muy duro y muy fuerte para tratar de proveer cuidado médico a toda nuestra población, que desafortunadamente las clases socioeconómicas más bajas del país son las que se están viendo afectadas y obviamente la gente dice, pero solamente se muere un 1%, y yo le dije, pero cuando el 1% es tu papá, cuando el 1% hace parte de tu mamá, cuando el 1% es tu ser querido, no importa que sea un 1%, es el ser que yo más quería en la vida. Entonces, condolencias a los que han perdido las familiares, los colegas en Colombia que han muerto uh, en las líneas de batalla, y pues, protégete, cuídate. Eh, a mí ya me dio la infección, la sobreviví, fueron cuatro semanas de miércoles, pero salimos adelante. Santiago, sin decir más y robarte de tu tiempo, agradezco tu colaboración para el podcast y Dios te bendiga. No, Alonso, mil gracias a ti por invitarme. Lo disfruté mucho. Fantástico. Bueno, recuerden, suscríbanse. Ahí hay un botoncito, una campanita ahí o en el subscribe que dicen. Se suscriben ahí, dejen un comentario. Si les gusta, aprovechamos un comentario. Si no les gusta, nos tratan con amor. Eh, pero de todas maneras ustedes saben que lo hacemos con mucho cariño y no hay eh, ninguna mala intención en el contenido que nosotros estamos poniendo se les agradece el apoyo, el soporte emocional, virtual, lo que sea se les, se les agradece de corazón Dios los bendiga Alonso y un, una pregunta ¿te parece si yo los edito? The Foreign and International Medical Graduate Podcast is proudly sponsored by nextdaypodcast.com as I said nextdaypodcast.com they provide podcasters like me with affordable podcast editing services with 24 hours turnarounds you simply send them your raw recordings and they do the rest if you're not podcasting right now at this moment check out their amazing podcast launch packages I'm one of those that is extremely satisfied And if you use the promo code Medical Next Day, that's Medical Next Day, you will receive 10% of any of their services. Again, that's nextdaypodcast.com.